And we did a number of years ago a History of the Bible series, a three-part series uh, called Part One, A Lamp in the Dark, The Untold History of the Bible. And then Part Two was called Tares Among the Wheat. And Part Three was called A Bridge to Babylon. And the Bible series, the whole reason for doing it was uh, I had spent years as a believer going to Bible studies. When I was a young uh, believer, I would go to uh, like personal Bible studies all the time with friends of mine where we would just gather in somebody's home and we would sit around with our Bibles. Now the Bible that I got saved on was a King James. It was an old Schofield Bible. Now today I have different ideas about the Schofield Bible because of what I learned about the critical text. But still I learned on a King James uh, translation originally and that's how I came to salvation when I was living in New York years ago. But then when I would get involved in Bible studies with friends of mine, they would have the NASB typically, or they would have some other modern translation. And we would have all these sort of discussions and debates about theology, how to understand things. And there would, sooner or later, there would come up a point of theology, an argument, a doctrinal argument, and they would, they would say something to the effect of, well, you know, the King James has it wrong what they would say. And you know, we've got, we've got the real reading over here in the NASB. And I would, I would listen to that. I didn't necessarily agree with them. I would tell them, I said, you know, that's kind of a strange reading, the way it reads there. It doesn't seem to make any sense. And uh, then I would debate on behalf of the King James. I like the King James originally because I like the majesty of the language. I always thought, thou shall not kill or honor thy father and thy mother. I always thought that just sounded much more godly and majestic and commanding than the modern versions and the way that they related to it. So I admit I had somewhat of a, you know, just a, an impressionistic favor toward the King James because I liked the way it sounded. Uh, but then as I began to look into it, I realized that there was a systematic attempt to undermine the readings of the traditional readings of the traditional text of Scripture. And so, thank the Lord, an opportunity was presented and we pursued this documentary series to try and lay out for the Christian community the history of what happened so that people can see how the Bible developed and then what happened through the 19th century. And what we do in the series is we talk about how the Bible was banned. It was outlawed by Rome uh, during the Middle Ages. And then it was recovered through the great Protestant Reformation. And what many people are not aware of is the Bible was a centerpiece of the Reformation. But then what happened was Rome launched a counter-Reformation with the establishment of the Jesuit order and their commission in the year 1540. So the Jesuits launch a counter-reformation, the purpose of which was to overturn the great Protestant Reformation and to bring mankind and Western Europe in particular back into the Dark Age, back under the authority of the Pope. And the whole reason uh, for outlawing the Bible was because they had changed the Christian faith. They had come up with all of these superstitious ideas. Uh, they had developed doctrines and teachings that had nothing to do with Bible-based Christianity. They were really guilty of, if you read John Fox and many others, of what the Pharisees of old had done. Jesus said to the Pharisees of old, uh, he said, they do worship me in vain, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He said, full well you reject the commandments of God so that you may keep your own traditions. And that's what Rome had done. And so to cover up what she had done, her apostasy and so on, uh, there were a series of debates that took place by non-Catholic Bible-believing Christian groups. We talk about this in A Lamp in the Dark. And they all reached a climax at what was called the Colloquy of Montreal in 1207 AD. And that's where you had a Catholic priest, a guy named Dominic Gutzman, and Dominic, he's called Saint Dominic in the Catholic Church. Uh, Dominic was debating with these Bible believers in the north of Italy and the south of France. And he got into 
uh, his final theological debate in 1207, and he apparently lost the debate. He could not convince them, and so he got angry, and he said, well, if you won't listen to my arguments, then you're going to be subjected to slavery and death, at least according to one historic account. Then he goes back to Rome, meets with the Pope, Innocent III, and another guy named Simon de Montfort, and they launch what was called the Albigensian Crusade. And that was really the beginning of what we know as the Great Inquisition. But it was Rome's attempt to go after Bible believers who disagreed with the Pope and the papacy about the Bible and what Christianity should be. That's very, very important. Many Christians don't understand what the Inquisition was and how it worked. The Inquisition outlawed the Bible, the reading of the Bible in the vernacular tongue, the common tongue of the people. You could not read it. If they caught you with a Bible, you would be arrested. You would be sentenced to death. Women were buried alive, typically if they were found with Bibles, and men were typically burnt at the stake. Women were also burnt at the stake. It, it varied from one place to another. Um, they outlawed the Ten Commandments. You could not teach your children the Ten Commandments of God. If you uh, get the books, or and there's a two-volume set on Fox's Book of Martyrs, pre-20th century, and you can read the story of uh, a woman named Mistress Smith, Mistress Smith, and she was a woman, and she was brought in by the tribunal. She was a Christian lady, and they asked her a series of questions, and she got through the, uh, the questioning, and then at the end of it, they gave her leave to go, and then as she was leaving, the constable took her arm and noticed that there was a rattling in her sleeve. And he said, well, what's this? And he opened her sleeve, and he reached in, and she had these wooden tablets with the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed. And so then they shouted heresy. They grabbed her, brought her back into the court. She was condemned, and then she was burnt at the stake. People don't understand what the Inquisition was. They think in modern times, what they, the impression that they give in our schools is that the Inquisition was some kind of a Christian movement where Christians were trying to force people to become Christian or something. That's not it at all. That's not it at all. Um, and I, I suspect, I believe for years, that the reason that they don't tell you the truth about the Inquisition in our schools is because if they did, people would begin to recognize that the Inquisition had a lot more in common with the secular humanist groups that are trying to get Bibles and prayer out of our schools, take down the Ten Commandments, stop people from preaching the gospel. Like what's going on over in England right now, you have street preachers who are arrested and taken to jail for preaching the Word of God. And see, if Christians understood what the Inquisition was, then they would recognize that these same powers that often masqueraded themselves as though they were Christian are really regaining their momentum in modern times. All right, so the Great Reformation happens, and then you have, we focus especially on the English Reformation and the development of the English Bible. So the English Bible is developed by our forefathers, uh, beginning with John Wycliffe, he begins the process, translating from Latin into Middle English, which was illegal, he wasn't supposed to do it, but he did it anyway because he believed God. Then you have William Tyndale. He's the first to translate from Greek into English. Tyndale is known as the father of the English Bible uh, because most of the phrases, 85% of what we call the King James translation today, comes from the translation work of William Tyndale. So things like, our Father which art in heaven, and fight the good fight, and so on. Many very familiar phrases come from the translation work of William Tyndale. So you go from the Tyndale translation, then there was this whole rash of English Bible translations through the Geneva Bible. And the reason that Geneva was so significant is because that's when they put chapter and verse together. So with the Geneva Bible, you have the first John 3.16. That's the first time you have John chapter 3, verse 16 laid out. 
And then after the Geneva comes the King James. And with the, with the development of the King James Bible, the English-speaking Christian world really believed that they had perfected God's Word in the English language. That's what they came to believe. In fact, we show in one of our films... Now, the reason I'm telling you all of this is I'm laying the groundwork for what we're going to talk about, how they changed the Bible in the 19th century and what happened and the development of what we call the critical text. The critical text is the foundational Greek text that they use for the modern Bibles. And it's that text that they use to tell people, well, the, the Bible has been rewritten over and over again. We're not really sure what it says. There's, there's all of these doubts about this verse here and that verse there. Whenever you see that on something like the History Channel or the Discovery Channel, or you ever hear that from an academic, it's largely because of the critical text. That's where they get these arguments from. And we have a video clip that we show in our documentary series of an Oxford scholar, a woman, and she's sitting there talking about what happened in the 19th century. And she says, well, prior to this time, she says, the English-speaking Protestant world, well, they had the King James Bible. They believed it was perfect, inerrant. And then Tischendorf, she says, made this great discovery of a manuscript called the Codex Sinaiticus. And that changed everything. And so they admit what happened. They admit that the English-speaking Christian world believed the Bible, believed it was perfect, believed God had blessed us uh, with uh, a preserved word of God in our language. And then it all changed. And so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how it changed. So this presentation is called The Critical Text Origins. Critical Text Origins. Now... In the Bible, God says he declares the end from the beginning. So I'm going to show you kind of the end, or at least why this issue is important. What this all amounts to. And we're going to start by talking about this gentleman here, uh, Dr. Daniel B. Wallace. Daniel B. Wallace, out of Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, Daniel B. Wallace is one of the leading conservative textual critics in modern times. And it's very, very important to understand that he is considered a conservative. So if something happens in the news, if they discover some ancient manuscript, or there's some development that challenges the New Testament text, they will often consult with Dr. Dan Wallace. And he comes out to defend the New Testament and to say that, yes, it really is reliable and this kind of thing. Okay, so he's typically seen as a defender of the New Testament, and he'll, he'll debate with people like Bart Ehrman, who openly denounces the Bible, says it is not the Word of God, etc. Okay, years ago, Dr. Wallace published an article called 15 Myths About Bible Translation. 15 Myths About Bible Translation, as I'm thinking of that. I want to pull out my Bible. I like to have it here. 15 myths about Bible translation. Myth number 14. What is the myth? The myth, myth number 14, is that red letter editions of the Bible contain the exact words of Jesus Christ. That's the myth, according to Dr. Wallace. That your red letter Bible contains the exact words of Jesus, and he says that's a myth. Now he explains it. Here's what he says. He says, quote, Scholars are not sure of the exact words of Jesus. Ancient historians were concerned to get the gist of what someone said, but not necessarily the exact wording. In truth, though red-letter editions of the Bible may give comfort to believers that they have the very words of Jesus in every instance, this is a false comfort. 
That's what he says. Now, it's important to understand that Dr. Wallace here is not talking about an English translation. He's talking about the original Greek. He's talking about the original manuscripts when they were written. He is basically saying that there is and never was an, a, a, an accurate, inerrant record of the teachings of Jesus Christ anywhere in history. Okay? That is what he's saying. Even if you could find the original Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it wouldn't matter. It's a paraphrase according to Dr. Wallace. And that's the conclusion that he's come to based upon what happened in the 19th century. Now, who agrees with Dr. Wallace? Well, I found this quote. We documented this quote. We put this in our film, Bridge to Babylon. A short time after I released that film, I stumbled upon this article uh, on Breitbart, Breitbart News. Breitbart News. And the headline uh, says, Jesuit Superior General we don't know what Jesus really said. We don't know what Jesus really said. Now, if you read the article, that is the Jesuit superior general Arturo Sosa. He is the current Jesuit general for the Jesuit order, uh, the order that is called historically the point at the end of the spear for the counter-reformation. And if you watch all of the presentations I'm gonna give today and tomorrow, I talk more about the Jesuits and I talk more about what they are doing right now, today, in America uh, and throughout the Western world. Uh, if you're concerned about things like socialism, communism, social justice radicalism, the LGBT movement, the development of political Islam and Sharia law, then you should definitely know who the Jesuits are and what their activities are because they are promoting all of these things through their schools and colleges and universities. And I believe that the assault on the Bible is for them, it's a very tactical move, one that they've been pursuing for hundreds of years in different ways, but they want to get the Bible out of the way so they can replace Christianity with something else. And I believe a system of socialism, and in fact, I'm gonna show you in my next presentation uh, that the current gen Jesuit general, Arturo Sosa, is a socialist. He is a socialist. With Pope Francis, they are both socialists and radical socialists. But what does the scripture say? Now they're saying, if you read this article, he actually comes out and says, well, yes, we need to believe Jesus, he says, but unfortunately, nobody had a tape recorder 2,000 years ago to record what he said. That's literally what he says in this article. But what does the scripture say? Jesus says, And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now think about that. If, if men are going to be judged according to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to know what they are. How could men be judged according to the words of Christ if we have no idea what Jesus really said? That would make no sense whatsoever. But we have the Lord's promise. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So just like Brother Ted was talking about earlier, we have in the Psalm God's promise that he will preserve his word unto all generations. We also have that not only for what's written in the, the Old Testament, but we have the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. All right, so how did this system of, how is it that today a modern conservative evangelical like Dr. Wallace just happens to be in agreement with the general of the Jesuit order and they both agree that nobody really knows what Jesus said. That's a very disturbing thought. Historically, if we went back just 150 years and talked to somebody like Charles Spurgeon, Spurgeon would be shocked at the idea if you read his writings. 
uh, but Spurgeon was a staunch defender of biblical inerrancy. And if you, if you read Dr. Wallace's writings, he openly admits that he does not believe in inerrancy. He just admits it. Uh, and that is the direction that conservative Christian academia is headed. That's why Wallace, I think, is so significant. Because over the next 10, 20, 30 years, they're going to get farther and farther away from faith in the Bible as the inspired, inerrant Word of God. Okay, so um, I wanted to recap what happened in the 19th century because it's so significant to everything that we're going to talk about over the, uh, the rest of today and through tomorrow. Um, here we have two guys, Westcott and Hort. Now most people here have probably heard about Westcott and Hort. Uh, Westcott and Hort, they were the leaders of what was called the Revision Committee back in 1881. And these are the men uh, who changed the text of the New Testament. Now not just the English text, the more significant change was that they changed the underlying Greek text. The Greek text that underlies the text of the New Testament. The Greek text originally was developed beginning with Desiderius Erasmus. Uh, and in fact, David and I were talking about Erasmus earlier and about how Erasmus had learned Greek from a Byzantine scholar, a guy named George Hermonymus, uh, who had come, who was part of the migration of Greeks from the east into Western Europe after the fall of Constantinople. And Erasmus learned from him. He learned at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and then he went and he lived in a Greek community for three years and committed himself to speak nothing but Greek. Then he goes and he prepares the first edition Greek New Testament that becomes the foundation of what we call the received text. Now the received text had five editions with Erasmus. Then it was taken by a guy named Stephanus. He developed a number of editions. Finally, you get to Theodore Beza uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, and he does a series of editions. So you have about a hundred years worth of work that is being done on the Greek text that comes to be called the text received by all. The text that everybody in the Christian world received as the Word of God. This is the Word of God. In fact, you had scholars in the 19th century who made the point, they, when they were arguing against what Westcott and Hort did, they said, we're not arguing just for the Erasmus text, we're arguing for the text that was believed by the entire Christian world. This is what Christians everywhere believed. It's what Roman Catholic, Greek and Russian Orthodox, and your various evangelical and Protestant groups. And that's what Westcott and Hort undermined. What they did is they undermined things like the last 12 verses of Mark. Let me give you a few, few examples. The last 12 verses of Mark, where Jesus is raised up bodily from the dead, and he appears to Mary Magdalene. He physically appears. And uh, they found two manuscripts that didn't have those verses, so they called them into question. Uh, well, as a result, you have all these theories about how Jesus was never bodily risen from the dead by all of these um, unbelievers that has developed as a result. That's one example. Then you have John chapter 8, uh, the story of the woman taken in adultery, where Jesus says, He among you who is without sin, let him first cast a stone at her. They call that into question. They say, no, that's not part of the original text. That was added centuries later. Okay, then you have Luke 23, where Jesus is on the cross. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They say, no, that, that's not part of the original text. That was added later. And many other examples besides. But you can see just from those three examples, these are major passages in the New Testament. To look at people and to say to them, and these modern critics, they do it even now. Every year at Easter, when you have pastors who preach, Luke 23, where Jesus from the cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. These critical text pastors will go online and they'll say, you know, pastor so-and-so, he should know better than to quote that verse because 
that's probably not part of the original text, etc. And they make all these critical arguments. And what it does is it puts what I call the continual question mark on the Bible. It's, it's like that voice of the serpent from Genesis, yea, hath God said. And so you're continually made to doubt whether or not you can believe what you're reading. I mean, if you just think about what Dan Wallace said, Dr. Wallace said, if you're reading the teachings of Jesus, can you really have faith in what Jesus said if you have to wonder whether or not this verse that you're reading is the true words of Jesus Christ? When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life, is that really what he said? Well, what if he said, I am a way? What if he said, I'm one of the ways? You see what I'm saying? If we don't know exactly what Jesus said, if we don't have an inerrant testimony of what he said, the things that he said can be interpreted many different ways. And of course, those who are into modernism and the new age and so on, that's exactly what they want. So this is why Westcott and Hort are so significant. Now, another significant figure is Konstantin von Tischendorf. Tischendorf revealed in his letters that their plan to change the Greek text was one that they had planned for many years. It's important to understand that they were not authorized to do this by the, the Revision Committee Council. They were not supposed to change the Greek at all. They were, the only thing they were supposed to do in 1881 was to update the English words, to, to make the English words supposedly more modern. And that's a whole debate that's gone on from then to now. But they didn't do that. What they did was, in a very underhanded manner, they went in and they created a new Greek text and they slipped it in secretly in such a way that nobody knew what was happening while it was happening. And then after they published the revised edition, there were scholars that were examining it and they said, wait a minute. They, they didn't just make a few adjustments here and there. They've created an entirely new Greek text. In fact, that's what Dean John Bergen called it uh, back in 1881 and 82. And when he examined what they did and the secrecy by which they operated, he wrote a letter to the bishop at the time. And he said to the bishop, he said, My Lord Bishop, all of this appears to me what in the language of lawyers is called conspiracy. That's exactly what he said. He said, these men have somehow or other conspired to undermine the Word of God. But we find evidence for what they were planning to do back in 1866 with Tischendorf. Tischendorf admitted what they planned to do. He said, quote, we have at last hit upon a better plan, which is to set aside this textus receptus, that's the received text, altogether and to construct a fresh text, okay? Now, people didn't know about that because uh, Tischendorf published that years later, okay, or years after he made his, uh, he published it in 1866. Uh, and then Westcott and Hort would carry it out later on. Now, Westcott and Hort, to understand Westcott and Hort, Westcott and Hort have been called Anglo-Catholics where they were part of the Anglican Church, which was a traditional Protestant church, but they had very strong leanings toward Rome. And most people did not know this in their lifetime. Uh, they only found out years later after Westcott and Hort had passed away and their private letters were published. That I think is very, very significant. Um, but one of the things that Hort says, he says, quote, the pure Romish view seems to me nearer and more likely to lead to the truth than the evangelical. That's in one of his letters. Uh, there are other quotes from Westcott and Hort where they're talking about the worship of Mary and how they think the worship of Mary is just as acceptable as the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they see it as being no different. To understand these quotes from Westcott and Hort, I think you have to understand what is called the Oxford Movement which was a move by the Church of Rome to bring the Anglican Church of England back to the Pope. It was, it was a 19th century version 
of the Counter-Reformation. Because that's what the Counter-Reformation seeks to do. To take all the Protestants, all those who are apart from the Pope, and bring them back to Rome to counter, to overturn, overthrow, whatever it is that they're doing, and bring them back to obedience to the papacy. All right, so Hort had, not only was he a Romanist, a closet Romanist. People did not know this. They thought he was a Protestant Anglican minister. That's what they thought. Uh, but if you read his letters, he talks extensively about a guy named John Henry Newman. John Henry Newman, who began as an Anglican minister and then became a Catholic priest. He left the Protestant church, becomes a Catholic priest. And Newman admitted years later that he had used deception, willful and deliberate deception. In fact, what the Oxford movement was, the Oxford movement happened when John Henry Newman, as an Anglican Protestant minister, goes to Rome and he meets with one of the leading cardinals there, a guy named Cardinal Wiseman. I talk about this in, in our film series, uh, but I'm trying to be as concise as I can be. But he goes there, he meets with Cardinal Wiseman, he basically tells Cardinal Wiseman what he wants to do. He says, I want to continue to be a Protestant minister, but I want to secretly communicate doctrines to try and get my audience to go back to the Catholic Church but I want to do it stealthily without them really knowing what I'm doing. And Cardinal Wiseman actually thought it was a good idea, so he gave them support. So John Henry Newman does this, and he does it with a series of other ministers. And so they all, they, and, and the thing is, Newman admitted this 20 and 30 years later in his writings, that he employed what he called the doctrine of reserve, which is he said one thing to his congregation, but then he reserved the truth to himself. And that's what he called it, the doctrine of reserve. Claimed he got it from the ancient Arians. All of this is documented. So, when you read Westcott and Hort, Hort is celebrating John Henry Newman. He thinks John Henry Newman is great. He, he says things in his letters like, well, I can only compare this person to Newman and him I all but worship using that kind of rhetoric, saying that he all but worships Newman, uh, paying compliments to people, and he says, well, I can only compare him to Newman, and higher praise it would be impossible for me to give. All right, so his highest praise was for Newman. Uh, he all but worshiped John Henry Newman. And what was Newman known for? Well, he was known for deceptively trying to undermine the Protestant church. And when you consider that, what Westcott and Hort did then begins to make all the sense in the world. That they were deliberately trying to undermine Protestantism. And what many, uh, many of us don't realize today is that back in the 19th century, they did not call this the King James Bible, typically. It was called the Protestant Scriptures, it was called the Book, or it was just called the Bible. It, it was the Bible. Uh, for English-speaking people. It was the Bible. But it was specifically called the Protestant Scriptures as well. If you get the book by John Dowling, The Burning of the Bibles, which I'm going to talk about in my next presentation. Now, here's what's, why this is important. Westcott and Hort put forth a theory. And this is important to understand, to understand why they continue, why the, the, the uh, establishment academia continues to reject the idea that the King James is the most, most faithful and accurate. It's because of this theory. And once you understand the theory, the theory works a lot like Darwinism and the theory of evolution. It's based on elements that they proclaim to be scientific fact. But once you break them down, you realize they're not scientific fact. They're speculations. And that's what we're going to talk about. Um, but their theory was, the Westcott and Hort theory, in a nutshell, is that what happened was there was an original version of the scripture that was shorter than the King James and the received text. And that what happened was 
somewhere between 250 and 350 AD, these church leaders in Antioch got together and they added all of these verses to the text of Scripture. They added the last 12 verses of Mark. They added the story of the woman taken in adultery, John chapter 8. They added this line about Jesus saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They added the story of the angel troubling the waters at the pool of Bethesda, etc. And then they added a series of words, verses, etc. so that they developed what is called the longer readings or the fuller text. They'll sometimes call it that way. And so they did this through two revisions or what they call recensions. Two revisions that happened somewhere between 250 and 350. And then what happened was they got their master version of it and then they made copies, thousands of copies throughout the ancient world. And that became the majority text. You see, because the problem that they had was the King James Bible is based on the readings that you find in 95% or more of virtually all the manuscripts in any language, Greek, Latin, uh, other language versions throughout the centuries, early church father writings, all of it. The King James represents the overwhelming majority of what everybody ever called the Bible prior to the 19th century. And so they said, well, how is that the case? Well, they said, it must be that church leaders added all this stuff and they put it in there. And then they made all these copies and spread it all over the world. And that's why most manuscripts have all these longer readings in them. That's what they said. Now, this man, F.H.A. Scribner, sat on the committee. He was a, a very highly renowned uh, Bible scholar and critic in the 19th century and he sat on the committee with Westcott and Hort and he listened to them go over this theory, Hort in particular. And he sat there and he voiced one objection after another after another because he said there's no historic proof for what you're saying. What you're saying is not documented anywhere. There's not one history book, not one church father, nobody ever mentioned this you're entirely making it up out of nothing, okay? And the way that Scrivener said it, he actually goes on about it. He has a whole book on this called uh, A Plain Introduction uh, to um, the New Testament, etc. But he says, quote, of this twofold revision of the Greek text, not one trace remains in the history of Christian antiquity. So there's no evidence of it. Now the thing, the thing to remember about that, the reason that's important, because some people might say, well, the records were lost. We have records going all the way back to the first century. When you had Gnostics in the second century that were tampering with the text of scripture, Irenaeus wrote his work against heresies and gave many, many warnings. Uh, when Jerome did his Latin Vulgate, there were all kinds of debates. People wrote extensively about it. The thing is, the Bible is the most manuscripted book anywhere in history. And there are so, you, you, there's, it's virtually impossible that anybody would make dramatic changes to the scripture and you wouldn't have alarms being sounded off by scholars and, and writers and teachers and so on. Be, and, and anybody who studies church history realizes this very quickly uh, because you can't really change a verse, a letter, anything of any significance without having people object or approve or whatever. But they're going to take note of it. There will be a record of it. What Scribner's saying is, here you've got these two major revisions of the text that supposedly happened where these lengthy additions are added, like the story of the woman taken in adultery and the last 12 verses of Mark, etc., and nobody says a word anywhere. He says that makes no sense whatsoever. And Scrivener talked about the significance of it. He talks about Hort, who came up with this theory, and he says, he, meaning Dr. Hort, does not shrink from declaring that, quote, all distinctively Syrian readings must be at once rejected. Now, when he says Syrian readings, what he's talking about is Antioch in Syria. Antioch in Syria, 
That's where believers were first called Christians in the New Testament. And he claimed that it was at Antioch. This is where they supposedly did these two revisions from 250 to 350 AD. Okay? So then Hort calls them Syrian readings. That's what he said. Um, so that's what he's talking about. So he says, all distinctively Syrian readings, meaning from the received text, must be at once rejected, thus making a clean sweep of all critical materials. Fathers, meaning early church fathers, versions, manuscripts, uncial or cursive, comprising about 19 twentieths of the whole mass, which do not correspond with his preconceived opinion of what a correct text ought to be. So what he's saying is Hort, Westcott and Hort, swept away 1920ths or let's say 95% of all the biblical evidence throughout history. They said it's, it's all worthless because it all represents this change, changes that were supposedly made uh, at Antioch, this really a fable, a fiction that they've invented. Now, how do they come up with this theory and how does the theory work? Well, the theory works based upon two primary manuscripts. The first of them is the Codex Vaticanus. If you had a Bible, a study Bible, most of your modern study Bibles, if you were to go to the ending of the Gospel of Mark, although many of you, if you have a King James, you, you may not have this footnote, but in many of your modern study Bibles, you go to the end of the Gospel of Mark and you will find a footnote there that says the last 12 verses are not found in the most ancient and reliable manuscripts or words to that effect. And then it will sometimes say the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus. Many study Bibles have this, some do not. Uh, but that's very, very common. Okay, so let's talk about the two manuscripts. And what they argue in a nutshell is that because the received text and the King James Bible disagrees with Vaticanus and then the other manuscript called Sinaiticus, because the King James disagrees with these two manuscripts, that means the King James is wrong. That's in a nutshell what they're saying. It does get a little bit more complicated, but if you want the short version, if you don't agree with Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, it's wrong. Okay, that's what they said. Now, here's the problem with Codex Vaticanus. They claim that this is one of the most ancient and reliable manuscripts. Well, let's talk about that. Uh, let's talk about the real history of Codex Vaticanus. They claim that it was created somewhere around 350, 353 AD, this kind of thing. They speculated that this was one of 50 manuscripts that had been commissioned by Constantine the Great in the fourth century. Then they claim it came from Alexandria, Egypt, etc. They have all of these different histories that they have created for Vaticanus. I call it fourth century fantasy land because that's what it is. They go into fourth century fantasy land and then they imagine all of these things about Vaticanus. But what they typically don't do in our Bible colleges is they don't tell young students the real history of Vaticanus. They avoid telling them that. Okay? And I know this from interviewing pastors. In fact, we have all these pastors that appear in our uh, film series and I've talked with them and they talk about going through Bible college and they say we didn't even know that there was two Greek texts okay because many people don't realize that when they say in the Greek it says this the question is which Greek are you referring to the received text or the critical text the critical text was created by Westcott and Hort the received text was developed by the reformers okay so, Codex Vaticanus, which is also called Codex B. The real history is that in the 16th century, uh, one of the great scholars really anywhere in the history of, of education, uh, Desiderius Erasmus, uh, who really laid the foundation for the received text by putting together his Greek New Testament. Erasmus, I believe, is a very important figure in the history of Christianity his recovery of the Greek text and then comparing it to the Latin that was being 
uh, used in Western Europe was very significant. It was Erasmus who discovered, for example, in the New Testament, that when John the Baptist is preaching and he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. In the Latin Vulgate, the word they use is do penance. Do penance for the kingdom of God is at hand. So you had this whole system of works-oriented penance that had developed in the Western Catholic Church, all based upon a misunderstanding of a single word. And Erasmus recovers this, that no, it's not do penance, it's repent. You change your heart, your mind, you turn away from sin. And then from there, Luther discovers Romans chapter 1, where it says the just shall live by faith. And so together, you have repent and believe. Uh, so it was said that Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. That's the way they communicated it. All right, so Erasmus rejected Vaticanus. When he was developing his Greek New Testament, he knew about Codex Vaticanus. He communicated with the Vatican librarian about it. But Erasmus believed that it was a forgery. And there's a number of quotes on this. Here's one from John Owen, a Puritan minister, who said that the Vatican, Codex Vaticanus, boasted by Huntley the Jesuit, which Lucas Brugensis affirms to have been changed by the vulgar Latin, and which was written and corrected, as Erasmus says, about the time of the Council of Florence, when an agreement was patched up between the Greeks and the Latins. Now that's one of a number of quotes. Uh, there, there are books that have been written on this, but Erasmus believed in a nutshell, the Council of Florence was an ecumenical council between the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to get the Greeks to alter their manuscripts to agree with the Latin Vulgate. Well, somewhere in this, it's, it's a mystery, admittedly, through that process at the Council of Florence in the 1430s, it's generally thought that's when Vaticanus was created or that it was possibly an old Greek manuscript that they altered. We honestly don't know. All we can do is speculate. But this is what they don't tell people, that Erasmus rejected it because he thought it was a forgery or a corruption of some kind, but he did not believe it was reliable. Okay, so, um, so these are the things to remember about Codex Vaticanus. One, Erasmus believed it was a forgery or a corruption from the Council of Florence in 1435. Vaticanus itself appears in the Vatican Library in the year 1475 AD. The technical history of the manuscript is it has no history before 1475 AD. That's where it just shows up in the Pope's library that year. Okay? Uh, and Erasmus rejected it, and that correspondence is well documented historically. Okay? So the manuscript Vaticanus was rejected for about 300 years until you get to the year 1810. And in 1810, you had a Catholic scholar named Johann Leonard Hug, who wrote a, a pamphlet on the antiquity of Codex Vaticanus, claiming that it went all the way back to the fourth century. Okay, a Roman Catholic scholar. Now, I want to quote, I'll give you a quote from this gentleman, um, J. Neville Birdsall. J. Neville Birdsall. J. Neville Birdsall was a paleographer. And then paleography is where I am leading you one step at a time in this presentation. I'm going to get there, but, but I want you to understand the significance of paleography and why it's important. And J. Neville Birdsall was a paleographer. He was considered an expert by the establishment people, by the British Library. Uh, he's highly commended by people like Dr. Daniel B. Wallace. Uh, uh, he, he was a contemporary with Dr. Bruce Metzger. Metzger was believed to be the greatest New Testament critic of the 20th century. Now, we don't necessarily agree with that, but that's what the establishment people think. That's how they think. So Birdsall was one of their guys. 
In a symposium given in 1999, he admitted the following. He was considered an expert on Codex Vaticanus. And he talks about its history and so on. And he says, in short, we cannot be certain of the exact date nor the place of origin of Codex Vaticanus, nor, in spite of scholarly efforts, can its history before the 15th century be traced, meaning prior to 1475. Now this is very, very important to remember because the arguments that you're going to hear against your King James Bible are the first thing they will say is, well, we have older manuscripts that are better. They're older and they're better and they're more accurate and that's why your King James Bible is wrong. That's what they're telling us in a nutshell. And the first question is, well, wait a minute, how do you know they're older and how do you know they're better? Okay, and according to Dr. Birdsall, Professor Birdsall says they have no way of proving this manuscript outside the 15th century. And that the way that they do it is through paleography. That's how they do it. Uh, and we're going to talk about what paleography is as we go forward. But Birdsall uh, admitted that Vaticanus had no impact on New Testament scholarship until the discovery of the next manuscript which is the Codex Sinaiticus. Here's what he said. He says, quote, Isolated and scarcely studied as Codex Vaticanus remained, it made little impact on the theory and analysis of the data of New Testament manuscripts. Nor was it, I consider, the printing of its text or the facsimile reproduction alone that made it spring into prominence that it has held ever since. Once you understand Vaticanus, the Pope's Greek Bible, that's what Vaticanus is, is considered the number one Bible in the world for textual criticism. That's how it is seen by your critical text people. But here's what Birdsall says. He says, it was the discovery of the Codex Sinaiticus in the same period that enabled scholars to perceive the distinctive form of text that these two majuscules presented. Once this text was more clearly perceived, its foil was to hand in the Western text already identified, etc. So what he's basically saying is that the Vaticanus, the Vaticanus has always had very strange, odd readings. Probably the most significant is that it deliberately omits the last 12 verses of Mark. What happens is when you are reading through the Gospel of Mark in the Greek text, you get to the ending of Mark and then there's a, a blank column there. Okay, And the verses where Jesus appears bodily, those verses are missing. And so scholars have debated, well, why are they missing? We don't know. And so they, they speculate and they debate. But at the time, um, in the 19th century, the only manuscript in the world that had that feature was Codex Vaticanus. Now the way it works in textual criticism is if you have a strange manuscript like that that has that kind of a bizarre feature, it's just seen as an anomaly or a mistake or whatever. Unless you have a co-witness. You have another manuscript that shows up that has the same strange characteristic. And then they claim now you have a family, okay? You don't just have one oddball manuscript, now you have a family. Enter Codex Sinaiticus 1844. Now what happened, and we unfold this whole history for you in Tears Among the Wheat, but what happened was the German scholar Konstantin von Tischendorf uh, went forward looking for ancient texts because he, you know, he, he was a German critic. Uh, and I think if you read his letters, it is not unfair to say Tischendorf had dreams of fame and glory as a textual critic. I think objectively you can say that. Well, Tischendorf, he arrives in Paris and he admits that he ran out of money in Paris. So he went to work and one of the things that he did was he went to work for the Catholic Church, producing a parallel Bible for them. Then he dedicates that Bible to the Roman Catholic Archbishop Afre, who was a very powerful 
uh, archbishop there in Paris. And then Archbishop Afre writes Tischendorf letters of introduction and then he leaves and he goes to Rome. So he gets his letters of introduction to the Vatican to go and meet with the Pope. When he goes to the Vatican, he also meets with a guy named Cardinal Angelo Mai, who was a Jesuit priest. And Cardinal Mai had been working on Codex Vaticanus for some 30 years. All of this fully documented. So Tischendorf meets with Cardinal Mai. He meets with the Pope. They have a, 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 a private audience. Tischendorf says they have a prolonged private audience. Well, then Tischendorf leaves the Vatican in 1843, and he arrives in 1844 at St. Catherine's Monastery at the base of what is called Mount Sinai in Egypt. There he discovers the first pages of what eventually will be called Codex Sinaiticus, the one manuscript in the world that will confirm the strange readings of Codex Vaticanus. So it just so happened that Tischendorf went to the Vatican meets with the people who have Vaticanus, then when he leaves, he discovers the one manuscript in the world that's going to confirm these strange readings. Now, an interesting characteristic of Codex Sinaiticus is the ending of the Gospel of Mark, just like in Vaticanus. You get to the last 12 verses, and what do you know? The Gospel of Mark stops at the same place, and then there's an empty space there. Okay? And the last 12 verses are missing, just like they are in Codex Vaticanus. Now, part of what made me suspicious about this is when I was at the British Library working on our film series, and I interviewed a man named Dr. Scott McKendrick. Dr. McKendrick is the head of Western Manuscripts. He's very prominent in the world of textual criticism. And they have the Codex Sinaiticus at the British Library. That's why we went there. And so we got to interview like the leading scholars on Codex Sinaiticus on this. And I asked him two important questions. One, I asked him about Codex Vaticanus. And here's what he said. He said, well, when you first see the Codex Vaticanus, he says, of course, you're told that it's a fourth century manuscript. He said, but it doesn't at all look like a fourth century manuscript. He said it looks very much like a 15th century manuscript and he said there's a very good reason for that because almost the entire manuscript was completely overwritten in the 15th century by a 15th century scribe. And I'm quoting him virtually word for word. You can hear him in our film. Okay? And the words that he said, as he said them, he said of course you're told it's a 4th century manuscript but it doesn't look like one. That stayed with me and that's why I started investigating Codex Vaticanus and what's the real history with this Codex. Then I asked him about Codex Sinaiticus and the last 12 verses of Mark and why they're missing. And he said, well, should I give you the more complicated explanation? And I said, sure. And he said, well, when you get to the ending of Mark in Codex Sinaiticus and you open up to the last two pages there, he says, almost the entire manuscript is written by a scribe that we call Scribe A. He says, we don't know their names, but we call him Scribe A. And he wrote the entire Gospel of Mark until you get to the ending. He said, but then something happened here in these last two pages. Some kind of mistake was made. And so they had to go in and they had to erase what was there. And then another scribe that they call Scribe D had to come in and create the shorter ending of Mark that you see. Okay? So he admits, the British Library today officially admits that the ending of Mark as they have it is not the original ending that was there, or, you know, with, when the manuscript was first created, whenever it was created. Okay? I continue to find that very, very suspicious. My belief has been that somehow or other Tischendorf and those that he was working with manipulated the Codex Sinaiticus and I believe they changed the ending somehow. Exactly how they did it, I don't know, but all the evidence is there. Now Tischendorf discovers 
Codex Sinaiticus, the first page is in 1844, and he discovers the balance of it in 1859, years later including a complete copy of the New Testament in Greek. Which is very significant because if you ever hear about Codex Sinaiticus, they call it at the British Library the world's oldest Bible. And you will sometimes hear these scholars and critics saying, well the world's oldest Bible has all these differences from the King James. Did you realize that? That's what they'll say. And the manuscript itself has some anywhere from 23,000 to 35,000 corrections in it. The reason I say it that way is those are the two different numbers that the British Library gives. Tischendorf said there were 14,800 corrections. Then the British Library, about 2012, said there were 23,000 corrections. Dr. McKendrick, these are the people who have the manuscript in their possession. So they're not reading books about it, they have the pages there. 23,000 corrections, he said, an average of 30 corrections per page. Then, several years later, I saw Dr. McKendrick in another documentary where he said there were 35,000 corrections. Now, I don't know if he was just mistaken or why that is the case, but somewhere from 23,000 to 35,000 corrections, an average of 30 corrections per page. Now, the critical community uses that statistic. They say, well, this is the world's oldest Bible, and it is just a mass of corrections. And they say, well, you see, nobody really knew what the Bible said. Nobody knew. They were constantly changing it, going back and forth and back and forth, and this is the oldest. And then they tell you that Vaticanus and Sinaiticus are the oldest and the most pure even though Sinaiticus has more corrections than any other Bible in history. Okay. Well, a problem for Tischendorf showed up less than a year after he published the Codex Sinaiticus. A Greek paleographer named Constantine Simonides came forward. He was in, living in England at the time and he saw a copy of a facsimile in public and there were witnesses around him uh, prominent witnesses, in fact, and he said, wait a minute, this isn't an ancient manuscript. This is a manuscript that I created in the year 1840, and it was intended to be a gift to the Tsar of Russia. Tischendorf has misidentified it. Okay? Then Simonides spends the next four years debating privately and publicly in the newspapers of England, writing all of these articles trying to warn the academic world that Tischendorf was wrong, he was mistaken, that this is not a genuine ancient manuscript, that it was created in the year 1840, and then he basically explained how he created it. And that the reason that Tischendorf had misidentified it was one, it's written on ancient vellum. And he said, yes, because I got the vellum, I found the vellum on Mount Athos. Mount Athos, they have these Greek monasteries there. Uh, his uncle, Benedict, was a uh, Greek Orthodox monk. Simonides himself had been raised up among Greek monks. Uh, he was an expert in Greek. Uh, they argued, I mean, his, his calligraphy was said to be miraculous. Uh, he was, he, it was said at the time that Simonides was, had greater knowledge of paleographical science than even Tischendorf. And that was put to the test years earlier when they were at the uh, University of Leipzig. And Simonides had presented a copy of the Shepherd of Hermas in Greek. This is 1855. And he presents a copy of the Shepherd of Hermas in Greek. And there were no other Greek copies, known Greek copies, in the world at that time. And all the scholars there are celebrating it and they say, oh, this is wonderful and so on. Uh, but then Tischendorf said he thought it was a forgery that had been created in the Middle Ages. And Simonides came back and said, no, Tischendorf, you're wrong. And then he explained why he disagreed. Well, at the time, most people agreed with Tischendorf. And they did not agree with Simonides. This is 1855 and 56. Three years later, Tischendorf discovers the New Testament part of Codex Sinaiticus, and in it is contained 
another copy of the Shepherd of Hermas in Greek. So now you have the second Greek copy of the Shepherd. When Tischendorf compared this Greek copy as part of Codex Sinaiticus with the earlier copy that had been published by Simonides, they matched. And they matched well enough so that Tischendorf in 1863 would retract his former objections and admit that Simonides' copy of the Shepherd was genuine. And Simonides said, well, of course it's genuine, Tischendorf, because I use this copy to make the copy that you have in Codex Sinaiticus. That's why. Now, the reason that's significant is because there were no other copies anywhere in the world, the known world, of the Shepherd of Hermas in Greek. Nobody else had a copy. And so this was one of the points that caused many people to believe that Simonides could be telling the truth. Okay? Okay, I need to, I'm running long. Yeah. I didn't know where to play. <laughs> I'm running long. We'll finish one statement and then we'll pick it up the next time. For you. Okay, I'll pick it up next time. I'm so sorry, guys. I have run long. I've just gone on and on and on. All right, real quick, I'll wrap this up. I will wrap this up. On the subject of Simonides, I'm going to wrap this up very, very quickly. Okay, so the Simonides affairs go, goes on. Um, they ultimately disagreed with Simonides. They agreed with Tischendorf. But... In the year 1907, you had a, uh, an English barrister named James Farrar. He published a work called Literary Forgeries. In that work, he said that the story of Simonides had never been fully resolved. Okay? And he said that the question about whether or not Codex Sinaiticus is genuine or whether or not it was created by Simonides is a question that must remain among the interesting but unsolved mysteries of literature. He called it an unsolved mystery. He said they've never resolved the issue. So these are the points I want to make, and then I'm going to close. The critical text facts that they don't tell Christian people. One, there's no historic evidence to support the dating of Codex Sinaiticus prior to 1475 AD. Two, there's no historic evidence to support the dating of Codex Sinaiticus prior to 1844 AD. And three, there's no historic evidence to support the Westcott and Horde theory prior to 1881 AD. So in other words, they have no historic scientific evidence to support the theory that they use for these modern Bibles. So how do they support it? The answer is paleography. That's how they do it. And that's what David's going to talk about next. Okay, thank you for listening, you guys. God bless you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.